Welcome to the WordPress Photography Podcast, the podcast for photographers who want to learn how to get the most out of WordPress to grow their photography business. You don't need to be a geek to understand WordPress. Settle back and listen as we show you how. Now, here's your host, Scott Wyden Kivowitz. Welcome to the WordPress Photography Podcast, where we strive to make WordPress easier for all photographers around the world. I'm your host, Scott Wyden-Kipowitz, and I'm the community and blog wrangler at Imagely, and I'm joined by my co-host, Rachel Conley, who is the founder of Photoscribe. This is episode four, and hello, Rachel. Good morning. Hello, Scott. How are you? I am doing well. Um, we're recording this on a lovely December morning when it's here in New Jersey, about 70 degrees, which makes no sense for December. Yes, um, in Boston, it's 60, so we're loving it. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a really interesting weather this this, this winter. Um, yeah. So we've got a really good guest today. Um, so Jared Bauman is our guest today. He was once a full-time working wedding photographer, but after 11 years, he sold the business and co-founded Shoot.Edit. So to this day, he continues running the industry's premium post-processing company for professional wedding photographers worldwide. The Shoot.Edit's website is running on WordPress, yay, as well, um, as well, and, uh, you know, so are 25% of the wedding photography websites out there, so that's pretty cool. Um, combine that with Jared's expertise in photography business and his incredible education around the topic, both on the Shoot.Edit blog and on Creative Live. Jared is a great choice for a guest for the show. So welcome, Jared. We're Hello, glad Jared. you're here. Hey, and hey. He's in, you, he's in California, so you're used to the 60, 70, 80 degrees all the time, huh? Well, I actually wanted to point out that this morning when I left my house, it was 31. So, oh, wow. So, so we're, we're winning here on the East Coast today. We are. It's a bit of a cold snap right now out here in California. You guys are getting better weather than us. Yeah, yes, yeah. that never happens. <laughs> um, so we, we like to start out the show, uh, before we even get into what's going on in your world, um, we like to start out the show with just a little bit of news in the WordPress photography space. And um, today, we are uh, the news we gonna, we're going to share is that WordPress 4.4 is out. Now, this may not sound so significant because it's just a minor point release, point release being it's 4.4, um, but it's actually very important for photographers because this is the first time WordPress has built in responsive image support into the core software. So that means it's faster loading times for websites when they have images, which pretty much every photographer is going to have. <laughs> so this is great for photographers. Basically, this will happen for every new photograph that you upload through the media library. You basically upload a photo that is, let's say, 1,600 pixels, just throw a number out there, at the longest length, and WordPress creates multiple versions of that image. For example, 300 pixels. Then on a small screen like an iPhone or an Android, WordPress will display that smaller size automatically so the website loads faster. That means on a small screen, you're not loading a 1600 pixel image, you're loading a 300 pixel image. So WordPress is now doing this built in to the software, no plugins needed to do that with the WordPress media library. Yeah, and that's huge. That is a big, big advancement yep. for photographers. So yeah, and we should say that the, uh, the size of the images that you upload depends on your theme. Um, I know a lot of photographers use pro photo themes and up above the publish panel it will tell you what the optimum size is for your theme. So um, Scott throwing out the number like 1600 pixels is really just throwing out a number. It really depends on what theme you have on your WordPress installation. Right. But so if, if you, um, if it also depends on um, really also the light box display. So if you want a photo to be, you know, expanded in a light box, a right. single modal window, to so to speak, uh, you click on a thumbnail and it enlarges. That is not reliant on the theme. That's reliant on whatever is driving that light box, and really whatever size you want that image to load for whatever screen size. So right. uh, on my site, I personally have all my photographs uploaded at 2,048 pixels, which is iPad size, really. Um, it's so it's optimized for an iPad nothing larger than an iPad. That way, um, you know, mobile devices are what people view the most these days. Uh, most, you know, they, they view websites the most these days on mobile right. devices. So um, 
Optimizing for me, I, I prefer optimizing for the iPad because I know people are coming on an iPad or smaller for the most part. Right. Um, but I also want it to look nice on a large screen for the people who are viewing it on a large screen. Right. So, so there's a little geek talk for you. <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, we got past the news. Uh, so, Jared, what's going on with you? Oh, man, it's busy. You, got, you talked about how it's December. It's, uh, we're getting ready for a, another upcoming busy year and um, you know, really start a trade show season, getting out in front of a lot of photographers, meeting with them. I think probably January through February and March is the busiest time for photographers. They, they have the time to get out and uh, go to trade shows, learn, educate, figure things out, get ready for the next busy year ahead. So that's what we're getting ready for as well, trying to uh, make sure we're all dialed in. Yeah. And so you're, you're going to be displaying at WPPI? We will. Yeah, we'll have a booth at WPPI again, as uh, as we always do, and uh, uh, you know that's one of the probably one of the biggest ones obviously everybody's heard of. But there's a lot of other good ones we'll be at this year too that are somewhat some some smaller, some bigger, but a um, lot of good opportunities all over the country these days to to learn and pick up photo education. Awesome. I hopefully I will see you at WPPI. Um, we're not doing a booth this year, but we will be there. Uh, hopefully, knock on wood, walking around, having meetings, chatting, mm -hmm. with friends. So. Great place for that as well. Yes. Yeah. Walk and wander. Yeah. Now, what now you are, since you're out there and you're seeing the photography industry, what do you think the trends are for the upcoming year in terms of education and things that photographers are looking for? Well, there seem to be um, a lot of people that are showing an increased increased interest in learning about the business side of photography, learning about um, the marketing. I mean, marketing has changed so much in the last five years from where it was. Even five years ago, I mean, I know it sounds kind of funny. We used to talk in terms of decades, and now it seems like the horizon has shortened a lot. So, um, judging by a lot of the content that we publish over here at Shoot.edit and what's getting the best traction, um, a lot of people are really gravitating more and more towards that marketing, that business education. Um, I'd say there's also a lot of people that are very interested in learning more about how to streamline their post production. We might be a little. Um, biased and that we hear about that maybe more than the majority, but there you know, definitely has been an increased interest in people trying to learn how to um, trying to learn how to make it less cumbersome, you know? There's definitely tools out there now with uh, an expansive uh, expansive options for presets and, and, and companies like us who can who can take on that color correction. But over the last couple of years there's been a lot of interest and it's been building to where right now we see a lot of interest in how do I streamline my workflow? How do I make it more efficient? How do I tie all these things together, if you will. And so I think there's going to be a lot more focus on that, too, judging by what we've seen so far. Yeah. Well, there's a hashtag on Instagram. Um, I think it's the Rising Tide Society that they do these Instagram challenges for photographers. And one of them was um, less work, more family, or more time. I mean, I think outsourcing some of the business tasks of your business, you know, of your photography businesses is definitely uh, what people are talking about. And you guys have been on the cutting edge for that at Shoot.edit for a long time. And I think a lot of the content that you put out uh, reflects that. Now, do you ever, when you talk to photographers about content marketing and blogging, what, what is your like number one, number two piece of advice to make it easier for them? Well, I mean, you, you know, you kind of hit the nail on the head. We, we obviously, you know, we uh, focus on helping photographers out with their post production, right. but really, we're trying to help photographers grow their businesses and, and and be better business owners. And the way we do it is through taking that post production component off your plate. And when we started to look at it from the standpoint of we're here to help photographers in business, not just not just with the post production, but in all those things. That's why we started doing all of that. Um, that's why we started creating all that content for photographers to help them. Um, when it comes to blogging, I mean, that is, we started hearing about the blog being so important because people were so concerned with making sure that um, the images that came back were blog ready. Uh, people wanted to make sure when they started using shoot.edit, that was something we would hear a trend of, which was how do I make sure as I set up this workflow that um, my blog images can get categorized, they can get tagged appropriately, these sorts of things. And that's where we started talking about blogging to photographers. Um, you know, it's it's funny, if, if you're a professional photographer, uh, the biggest thing that we've heard from our photographers that leads to success for them in blogging is setting up a blog calendar. Um, mm -hmm. It's uh, it's something where I think photographers tend to not realize the effects that a consistent blog can have yeah. because they might blog a lot more in the off season and then not as much in the busy season. But setting up a blog calendar, even if you blog 10 blog posts like you might normally do in the winter or the off season, scheduling that out so you have consistency because your audience begins to expect that, begins to count on that, begins to appreciate that. Yeah. You know, so uh, regarding blog calendar, so in the last, I think it was the last episode, or no, it was actually episode two, 
um, we talked to Christine Tremolay, and uh, one of the topics that came up multiple times was actually CoSchedule, which is a, an editorial calendar plugin that has a bunch of cool features built in. So that's an, uh, a, a plugin that can help for, for photographers who want to digitally manage their, their blogging calendar. Um, there's a free plugin called WordPress Editorial Calendar, which is very basic. It's literally just a drag-and-drop calendar, uh, but that's completely free. But for anybody who is not uh, does not want a digital editorial calendar, I, I personally recommend uh, Colorville Actions. has a really mm-hmm. nice um, printed organizational like book. That, uh, I forgot what the actual name of it is, but uh, we'll link to it in the show notes. Um, yeah, they do and, a great job. Yeah, so it's a physical book that you get in the mail, and you fill it in with your content, organize everything that way. So it's really useful. Yeah, they also have a sister company called Paper and Prosper, and they have an album of... Uh, uh, an album, uh, a book for all entrepreneurs called The Briefcase. Yes. And what I really like about that is if you are a pen to paper type of person, they have slots for all of this editorial stuff. Um, yep. I use Asana, and actually, Jared, you were the one who introduced me to that because it's <laughs> free online. It's great, it's very robust, um, and you can do that sort of editorial calendaring. Um, uh, online as well, but it's 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 adding another workflow and another piece of software. Um, but my question for you, Jared, was was there any other consideration for your website other than WordPress when you knew blogging was going to be important? Did you have other platforms, or how do you guys use WordPress in your everyday? Well, WordPress is fantastic, and when we decided on WordPress, it was actually even bigger than just the blog. It really, WordPress, as we evaluated the technology um, that we had at our disposal, the reason that we chose, I, I don't want to say it's the only reason, because I'm not the only guy around here, you know, who has um, has a lot of smart education about this. I'd say there are actually people around here who are smarter than me about this kind of stuff. <laughs> um, but I know for a fact that as we sat um, in our, uh, as we sat around evaluating it, WordPress gave us the most flexibility to be able to do many, many things on one platform. We could have our website um, uh, run on WordPress, and our website serves a very different purpose than our blog does. But our blog could also run on WordPress, and our blog. Um, which does such, so, you know, so many different things for us. We had so much flexibility around what we were doing and having it all managed in one central location. To to us, that was really valuable because it, um, and I think this kind of applies to a lot of photographers. Um, if you're looking to streamline your web presences, WordPress, from what I can tell, it gives you the most um, the most bang for your buck. It gives you the most uh, cross platform management in one area so you don't have to become an expert in a whole variety of softwares and even hardwares you become um, you become educated in one area and you can use that to manage multiple platforms yeah yep. you guys have an editorial team in terms of creating content how many uh, times a week do you put out posts and dynamic content for your for your readers uh, well, let's see. We'll be doing about three to four blog posts a week in 2016. Wow. Um, we'll probably be doing, uh, you know, anywhere from one to three guides a month in 2016. Um, probably 30 to 40 webinars in 2016. That's great. Um, so, so basically you're saying 2016 is going to be a very slow year for you. Yeah. Yeah, 2016, I mean, I figure we'll probably just, uh, we're, we're definitely winding down, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a lot of content. Yeah. How do you um, and what do you recommend to photographers to stay inspired and to stay, you know, to put out all of this different types of content? I know your audience is photographers, so it's a little bit different than photographers' mm-hmm. audiences who are their clients. But how do you stay inspired? Well, I don't think it actually necessarily is that different. Certainly, we do, uh, if you would call it B2B, business to business, and maybe uh, certainly as a photographer, you're doing more B2C, business to customer. Um, <clears throat> but it really is, it's, it's, it's not that much different. Uh, you know, I think that uh, uh, it can be overwhelming, and we certainly didn't start there. Rachel, you, you and I have been friends for a while now, and you know our, our, our kind of our genesis or our journey to get there, and that's the first step is start small, start yeah. with baby steps. Yep. 
learn, evaluate, measure, and then um, pivot and do more of what's working and do less of what's not working. Um, but I think the consistency is the most important thing that you can do. It's, in my opinion, it's better to do, for example, one blog post a week, but do that consistently than do three blog posts one week and then wait a month. Yep. Right. Um, in whatever communication you're having with your customers, whether it be email, whether it be um, uh, or blogging, or even on your website, uh, consistency is probably the most important thing. You want your customers to be able to, to know they can count on you. Um, if it's a weekly email, if it's a daily blog post, if it's a you know a monthly update, whatever it is, that consistency um, it also helps keep you in the rhythm. Going back to your question about inspiration, it keeps you in the rhythm, which keeps your your um, your mind focused on it. And I think that that consistency on our side, not only for our photographers who follow us, but on our side, on the creation side, has been what's allowed us to keep that process going and keep churning out hopefully what people value as good content. Yeah. Um, so I've got I've got one one question before we move into uh, the next the next topic, but um, this just came up from what you were talking about. Uh, so um, being inspired is one thing, but I actually wonder what tips might you have for photographers watching or listening or reading um, <laughs> on how to come up with potential topic ideas? Because you guys are spitting out great content all the time uh, and and it's it's impressive because it's always something that is very valuable for your audience. So I wonder, where do you come up with what? Where do you find the the inspiration for the topics mm -hmm. for, that you're actually putting out? That's a good question. That was um, that was something we we actually spent a lot of time talking about um, on Creative Live in. Uh, uh, and earlier this year, it was kind of what, what, where, what, how do you develop content? What do you do? Um, what do you focus on? Those sorts of things. The, the first thing that you have to do, as, as, especially as a professional photographer, this is where we start. You have to know exactly who your target market is, who your target client is. You have to know who your perfect client is. If you don't know who your target um, client is, if you don't know who a perfect client is, you got to start by figuring that out. Once you figure that out, you want to speak exclusively to that person. You want to give them a name. You want to know who they are. You want to know where they eat, where they shop. You want to know um, what they like to do. You want to know the tenants about what make them who they are. Are they, are they wine drinkers? Are they travelers? Are they homebodies? Are they family people? Are they in their 20s and their 30s and their 60s? You want to know all the tenants about them. Once you know that, that's the first step because then you write to them. You, you build for them. You create for them. It, it, it's very difficult when you sit back and go, I have to create content. I have to write a blog post and you don't have that. But when you start thinking about, hmm, I have to write a letter that's valuable to this person today, and it's this person that you've defined. It becomes to get a lot easier. And then you start answering the question, what are their needs? What are their wants? What are their aspirations? Where are they right now? What are their struggles? Where do they want to go? What are the things they need help on? What are the things that I can do to help them out? And it becomes a much clearer picture for you as a writer, for you as a content creator, and for you as a marketer to try to help those people out. And building content, and really all marketing in general, is all about helping your target customer. It's all about helping them. It's all about making um, sure that you provide value for them and that you love on them. And, uh, and I do believe that the business will follow if that's your model. Yeah, I, and I have to put a plug in for the Creative Live content marketing class that Jared did. It, it was three days. It's really intensive. Erin um, Youngren came in at the end too, and she really talked a lot about um, you know your target audience and how they use it. Um, we should talk to the young ones. They have a really great multi-site setup in WordPress, and they they work on it. And it's the same sort of mentality that Jared. They really love on their target audiences with their target brands. So, but yeah, we'll we'll link to the Creative Live course in the show notes. Yep. Um, yeah, um, I have one more interjection. Just um, yep. I was talking to a photographer friend of mine recently, and she said, you know, I blog once a week. I blog all of my sessions, and I chose not to blog. Um, one wedding because it wasn't sort of in my target audience, uh, but the that that client noticed. Do you have mm -hmm. any recommendations, Jared, for you know consistency? Consistency is key. Talking to your target audience is key. But what happens when you know you have a wedding that isn't your target audience and it's the only wedding you don't blog? You know, what do you do there? Uh, consistency. You need to blog it. Yeah. Um, we did. Yeah, it's, funny, it's funny you brought that up because that that's actually something that we hear. We've I've heard that a lot. Um, what do I do about this one topic? I shot a wedding that I'm not inspired by that I don't that doesn't have images that my I want my audience to really see. We did a whole webinar on that with Amy and Jordan uh, Demos, and it's, it was all about curation. It was all yeah. about how to curate. And one of the big topics in that webinar was how do you curate when you shot a wedding that you that's don't necessarily want published because 
at the beginning they started by saying that consistency is key. And so it really comes out of curation at that point, knowing and learning how to cure. And that's a skill, by the way. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's just like shooting shooting pictures. Curation is a skill, and yeah. not to some degree, uh, photographers need to be good curators. And so for that person and for those people that are in that sp- space, I'd recommend better curation, um, really uh, maybe not showing as many images, maybe telling more stories and yeah. those sorts of things. But um, uh, to that point, I think uh, also another thing that photographers can consider is how many images they're showing their blog. Um, I think there's a trend uh, right now that photographers are showing a lot of images. And uh, to some degree, I think that's both bad curation, meaning it's harder to eliminate good pictures than it is to just keep them all in there. Right. It's also partly we're not thinking about our target market when we're blogging. As a f- professional photographer, you've got to understand what they want to see, not necessarily what you want to see. Yeah. Um, why do I bring that up? Well, because it's a lot easier when you shoot a rough wedding or a wedding that doesn't necessarily have everything that you want. It's a lot easier to get 20 images out of that to blog than it is if you've created a consistency pattern of blogging 150 images. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. That's so true. Well, it's good that we're on the same page because that's exactly what I told her. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so let's talk real quick about um, outsourcing, specifically outsourcing your WordPress website design and photo processing. So um, a lot of photographers will wind up go and, and just buy a WordPress theme and, and will just stick with the template as, as it is, which is fine. But there's a lot of photographers now that are starting to take this new trend of actually take either taking that theme and then having it customized or just having one built from scratch. So I wonder, what uh, do you think it's valuable for photographers to uh, customize a theme that they, that they purchased or got for free or uh, or hire a someone to customize one from scratch? Do you find either are important and or one more important than the other? Well, it's a great question, and I think I, I think the, the best, for my angle on that would be to look at the best use of your time as a professional photographer and where you get your value. The beauty to me about a WordPress platform um, is, is honestly less on the creation side of things and more on the maintenance side of things. I think that WordPress provides a lot of value for a photographer because you don't necessarily have to hire a technologist every time you need to make a little tweak. Right. And that's why it's so valuable. The problem with... The problem with not doing everything yourself, you know, the issue if you were to look at doing everything yourself is the time and the energy and the expertise that goes into that. The issue with not doing everything yourself when it comes to your website is maybe you get the initial build, uh, build done by someone else, but is it in a platform that you can make an adjustment here or an adjustment there? I would really recommend that in the initial build or in the initial modification, I don't really think photographers are using their time best if they're spending their time on that. I think they're using their time best if they're out doing other things. I mean, that's the same approach we take here with, with the color correction and the post-production. Right. Um, is color correction something that photographers can do? By and large, yes, it is. However, it's not the best use of their time. And every minute they're spending doing color correction is a minute they're not getting paid for, and it's a minute they're not outgrowing their business, and it's a minute they're not out doing what they love, which is photography. So there's really not much reason to be doing it. Um, it when, you're building, when you're building your, your website, um, sure, you have the assets in terms of the images, and you have the word or the copy in terms of what you want written, but the actual building of it is, in my opinion, not the best use of your time. Maintaining it, though, updating it, and that's something that WordPress gives you a lot of flexibility in doing. I think that's where the value is. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, yep. it's, it's WordPress allows you to do that where some of the other platforms do not. You know, and, and for, for photographers who can't afford right out of the gate uh, can't afford a custom th- a custom theme or to have a theme customized. There's a lot of theme developers um, that will offer a an installation package, affordable installation package. Well, they will actually set up your website for you, do whatever tweaks. They'll chat with you, um, either phone or email, whatever's offered in the plan, and they'll come up with you know whatever whatever customizations that the theme can do um, that you want done specifically for you and. Get, help get your website up and running so that uh, you don't have to go through that process and waste your time when you could be out shooting, making and money see, that way. And that's a great idea because then you get it set up properly, and then if you need to make tweaks and updates, you can do that because you right. know it was built on a foundation that was done with an educated expert in mind. You know, yep. Somebody who's an expert set it up and built the base for you. And then if you need to make an update or two, you can always go and maybe do that if that's something you choose, but it gives you a lot more flexibility. But, um, I mean, that's kind of like the 90-10 model we employ over here at shoot.edit, which is 
Um, we don't tell photographers we're going to do everything for them. We can, right. and for a lot of photographers, they do have us do everything from cull to color, um, some artistic edits to publish, but most photographers use us to do the heavy lifting, to do the hard part, the part that takes them the most amount of time. That's yep. the color correction. So we right. like to say that we do 90% of the heavy lifting for you, just leaving you that last 10%, the fun part, the editing of the artistic stuff, um, but we take off 90% of the workload. Same kind of prim principle where if you need to go in and tweak some things, you have that flexibility and that capability, but you're not doing the majority of the laborious work that you're not an expert in and that somebody could help you set up a solid foundation with. Yeah. Yep. I love that 90-10 model, and I really feel that throughout the photography industry, um, photographers are, are recognizing that they can do that for, like, we do it here for blogging at Photoscribe, and then with color correction for shoot.edit, and Imagely is, is going to be, I think, a niche partner for WordPress, for WordPress websites in that, you know, they'll be able to have that 90-10 where you guys imagely can do 90% of it, and then, again, the 10% that they want to do, the little tweaks, the uploading, that they're able to do. But um, I love that 90-10 model. I tell right. it to everybody because I think it's so important that as solopreneurs, photographers think, I'm going to do it all and I'm going to save myself money. But by doing them it all, they're actually spending time, which time is money. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that t doing the analysis of what is worth more your time your money your clients your I mean you know there's no perfect answer but yep. I, I, I think 90 10 gets you there <laughs> yep. um, Jared do you don't happen to have any uh, any downloadables about your 90 10 um, methodology that photographers can learn about the value of that with um, shoot on edit yeah we do we have a we have a blog post actually on um, I I actually just searched for it last week because I was sending it to somebody. If you just go to our blog and search 90, <laughs> yeah. really? the top post, actually, I just did it last week. I was sending a photographer the, the blog post about it. But, awesome. Um, then yeah, I will... Uh, nice little definition. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely link to that in the show notes, and I'm, I'm going to pull it up right now. Yeah, I got it. Okay, cool. So I'll, yeah. I'll include that in the show notes. Um, now let's let's move on to uh, what theme or plugin, and possibly plural, <laughs> do you... Uh, do you recommend for WordPress for, that photographers could take advantage of, and why? Hmm. Um, pl I, I thought I'd talk about plugins. We actually just did a, a wonderful, fun um, plugin blog post um, uh, uh, where we we kind of went through a bunch of blog, a bunch of uh, sorry plugins that photographers we thought photographers should really be using. Um, I know that Yoast is a already popularly talked about one on your podcast uh, yeah. your show here, so I won't. <laughs> go into it, but I will throw in another vote for Yoast and say that it's um, we use it. I, uh, it's a fantastic uh, plug-in, and uh, it's really wonderful. Um, one of the ones that uh, I also think has a lot of value for photographers that we use is, uh, is Ninja, Ninja plug-in. Uh, it's a Ninja pop-up plug-in. Mm -hmm. um, uh, now, I will caveat that pop-ups, if done wrong, can be very annoying. And yeah. so I think the most important thing to start with is to understand the goal of a pop-up and to understand when and how to use them. Yes. Um, and with, with that understood, though, I, we found that the um, Ninja pop-up plugin is amazing, amazing as a plugin and so simple to use when it comes to WordPress. Um, again, we use it in a very focused fashion. We only use it in select spots, but that's what's so great about it is you have the, it's robust enough that you can decide exactly what specific URLs you want it to show up on. You can decide which URLs you want it to be excluded from. We only use it on our blog, and we only use it in certain blog posts. We also can control the timing of it, and that's another great thing about it. I think timing's a really important indicator of when you have your blog, uh, sorry, when you have your pop-up go live, and Ninja gives you the full capability. And then the third reason why I love it, uh, we can unpack and talk more about it too, but I just thought I'd get the kind of the top three out that I love about it, um, is that you can add all your own CSS on top of it, and so yeah. you can add your own branding on top of it. You can make it look pretty much however you want, as large as you want, as small as you want, and, and then fourth. Sorry, there were four of them. <laughs> is that you can serve different ones via uh, depending on web versus mobile versus tablet, and yeah. so you can have the same pop-up, basically the same uh, goal with your pop-up, but it will serve a different looking pop-up depending on where you're looking at it from. And so, um, so those four areas I think make it. We really, really researched it a lot um, over here. Our content team, we went through the whole thing, really researched a lot of it. We found it to just be uh, the best option, and it's certainly in using it for the last uh, nine months or so, I think it's really been a great option for us. Yeah, I'd like to unpack the timing, because I don't know, I personally didn't know about it until I downloaded Ninja Pop-Ups, 
And I think that it's it's really important to talk about if you're going to use a pop-up and you put it in select places like only on your blog and then you have it come up if a person scrolls down past a certain or is on your, your site for seven seconds. I mean, I think the likelihood of if someone's on your site for a certain amount of time and then a pop-up pop comes up, they're, going, they're more likely to click on it than if it pops up right away because they're into the blog, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're looking for ways to interact more with your website by being on your website for a certain amount of time. So I think that's really important um, it's, to talk it's, about. It's very, and we've tested it. You know, you know me, I, I like to test everything before yeah. we say it's, it's truth, but um, you know, we, we tested the pop-up up up against kind of drop-off rates, bounce rates, exit rates, time on uh, blog post uh, and all that and um, you know we really found that just as you would assume go figure the longer you wait to show your pop-up obviously the less people it will hit dramatically I mean the amount of people that are on your website or on your blog for five seconds versus say 30 seconds is actually quite a bit different most people yeah. you know the majority of the people that read your blog aren't there for very long unfortunately so the amount of times the blog the, the pop-up in this case in the blog would be served to be a lot less but the impact the engagement is significantly higher um, the longer you wait, and so you want to find that balance. You don't want to wait so long yeah. that um, uh, that you lose everybody, but you want to wait until you're dealing with just the group of people that are really engaged in that in that specific uh, web page or blog post, and then that's where a well-timed and well um, uh, contextualized blog post pops up. You know what wouldn't work very well is if you are, um, are a professional photographer and you're blogging about um, professional weddings, you know, your weddings you shot, and then you had a pop-up come up about um, the local Christmas festival that, that, that week. Right. <laughs> you, you have to have something that's very relevant to your wedding photography blog post pop up in that space, and so it has to be very relevant for people, but yeah. the timing is very important. Yeah, I love how WordPress gives you the te technology through plugins, but you also need to understand the sort of psychology behind it, too. And um, So that actually triggered another question I had for you. Um, since we're talking about plugins and WordPress, do you have any recommendations for those metrics that you collect so much and love and study? Not, <laughs> <laughs> Not through WordPress, I don't. Um, we we do it. Um, we we have a, a different a number of different tools we use. Um, uh, we we use Hootsuite for some of the different metrics that we collect. Yeah. Um, I believe, and I correct me if I'm wrong. Coast Schedule came out after we'd already set up our system, and so. Yeah. While I love it and frankly I'm kind of obsessed about it from the side, we don't use CoSchedule. Um, I don't know if CoSchedule has the same metrics, but um, specifically for a plugin tracking, we use Google Analytics to track that. And so yeah. specifically for Ninja pop-ups, um, we use uh, Google Analytics and it will tell us, you know, we set up a conversion path through Google Analytics so we know when we people convert, when it works basically, sorry. And, um, and then we can see how many times it's been served and viewed. So we kind of evaluate um, our effectiveness in terms of um, uh, how many people view it versus how many people kind of convert and use the pop-up and obviously the more people that convert on it the, the more successful it is for us but also the more relevant it is for people and then you compare that up against the same Google Analytics that have kind of exit percentages and how long people are on the site and if you're finding that you serve a pop-up after 20 seconds and then you look at and compare the month before you served the pop-up and the view time was a minute and 30 seconds and then after you start serving the pop-up the, the view time dropped to an average of 50 seconds you really know that it's not um, it's not it's not it's, it's it's intrusive for people they find it you know annoying so you want to um, if you can um, my last point on metrics if you can if you don't have a good base to evaluate on then it's really hard to evaluate yeah. and so if you're thinking about putting a pop-up in but maybe it's not something that you have time for right now the, the best thing you can do is start tracking your Google Analytics right now because then when you do go to have your pop-up and when you do go to test these things when you go to use anything you want to test down the road maybe it's you want to start testing three blog posts a week instead of two you have a base of numbers that you can compare up against and that's really the only way to evaluate is if you start tracking now even if you're not going to add some of this stuff in right now yeah, that's a great idea. I don't have a plugin for Google Analytics. Do you, Scott, have a one that you recommend to install it on a WordPress site? Just for a standard Google Analytics plugin? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Yoast Yoast Analytics. Oh right, uh, duh. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's, Hello. <laughs> it's fantastic, um, and it has a lot of cool features that uh, uh, I gotta add this to the show notes now too. Um, <laughs> that. Uh, just typing it in. Um, so it has a lot of features that uh, you can tweak and see things with with Google Analytics within, and it has a little bit of stats um, all within WordPress in the in your in your dashboard. Um, it's fantastic. 
there's a premium version as well, which has even more features. But yeah, but that's um, a great that's a great piece of advice, Jared. So even if you're not ready to do plugins or conversions or you know some of the more serious marketing, get that Google Analytics on your site and start tracking. Well, and I think that goes back to having an expert. I mean, Google Analytics. I'm a numbers guy. I, I majored in college in statistics, basically, <laughs> and I love numbers. And even, but even Google Analytics, when I open it up, it can be a little scary if you don't know yeah. your way around in there. And uh, however, I, I, I know what I want to see. Like I want to see how well something's performing, right? Like that's a pretty easy. Um, uh, we all understand that. We all understand. Hey, the longer people are on my blog or my website, the more they're enjoying it. We all kind of understand these things. But having somebody come in and help you in setting up your Google Analytics. Um, if the Yoast uh, plugin isn't enough for you to get the the analytics you need, have somebody come in and help you. But then you can mm -hmm. do the reading on them day in day out. You can yeah. interpret them because it's once you have somebody help you, an expert help you in setting up what you need, then it's pretty easy to actually be able to read them and then study them and then kind of know what to do based on them down the road. Yeah. Um. So uh, I have got uh, one one question for you before we um, wrap up. Um. So. From now, this is not technically WordPress related, but uh, it's, it falls right into Jared's uh, wheelhouse. So, um, Visco Keys has existed for a while. It's now retired from Visco. Um, Visco Keys was a software-based Lightroom controller that you can basically make your own keyboard shortcuts to do a bunch of things. Visco retired it, made it open source. It's now available for free for anybody. Um, but there's now a a, a new software out there, and I'm wondering if you gave this a try. I have it, haven't actually had a chance to use it yet, but I'm wondering if you or anybody on your team tried it and if they recommend it for photographers. Um, it's called Control Plus Console. Um, it's a iPad-based app that uh, you basically do a bunch of natural swipes to do different tasks in Lightroom. Um, so I'm just wondering if you, uh, if you have tried it, seen it, and uh, if anybody on your team has tried it. We've um yeah we I don't um I can't speak to that one specifically um but I know that we've evaluated Lightroom on an iPad for quite a while and it just doesn't have the it's not a good workflow tool for you if you're talking about setting up a sustainable post production workflow um, and so that's why we tend to avoid recommending those only because when it comes to who we see again going back to target market I mean we work best with a professional wedding photographer. You know, we're best suited at shoot to help a professional wedding photographer in everything that they shoot. So we do all of the uh, weddings, portraits, um, engagements, those sorts of things. And for a professional wedding photographer, the workload that's required in Lightroom needs a more robust workflow than something you can do on an iPad. Um, and so for, for our target market, it's just not something we spend a lot of time worrying about because our photographers aren't using iPads to do um, the majority of their post-production. Maybe a quick edit here and a quick edit there but it's the exception of the rule, not the uh, not the actual workflow they set up. Yeah, what I really liked about Shoot Edit, it, what I love about Shoot Edit is, you know, you guys were supporting Aperture for a long time. You moved from Lightroom 4 to Lightroom 5. I mean, you've always stayed on the cutting edge, um, which is why we really wanted you here to talk about WordPress, the cutting edge of technology for photographers and, you know, especially wedding photographers who deal with thousands of images at one time, you know. The difference between a wedding photographer and a portrait photographer in that situation can be hours or days of editing. I think you, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, you know, um, Lightroom CC had so many advancements and so many mobile advancements too, by the way. I mean, it's no secret that as we as um, as marketers, as business owners, as photographers, Scott, you mentioned at the very beginning, I mean, uh, we've seen that more people now are on our website and on our blog on a mobile device than they are on their desktop, you know, and I think that's probably the case for most photographers as well. And as we enter this world where more more is done on mobile than it is done on a desktop, a mainframe computer, I think that, um, you know, we at Shoot.net are paying attention to what that looks like for the post-production side of things um, as well. Uh, but I will tell you that the majority of people are still using a desktop to do their their bulk post-production work and, and to do their, 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 you know, run their business kind of work. And we're going to have to see how that develops as the years go by and see if actual work production shifts to a mobile environment as well. That'll be interesting to see. Yeah. yeah. Well, cool. Well, um, any any final thoughts before we wrap up? No, I appreciate you having me on. I think this is a really great topic for photographers. Um, I've never seen this get so much attention, and I think it's really valuable because, um, you know, increasingly, 
uh, not that it ever wasn't, uh, but increasingly, um, the ability you have to connect and meet your customer, the areas they like to consume and be met at, um, the increasing ability you have as a photographer to do that, the more um, the more you're going to get traction, the more you're going to be on their radar, and the more you're going to be in touch with them. And you know, this is the way that people are interacting with this world now is through um, is through websites, is through uh, blogs. Um, and uh, you know, I think that uh, uh, you guys are doing a really good thing by having this on. I'm excited. It's fun. You guys have a little. Uh, you guys have a, a real a real good team here between Rachel and Scott. This is quite the most team here. I'm I'm kind of jealous. But <laughs> the power pack group of people. So yes, <laughs> and then we bring it down. We bring it down so everyone can understand. Yeah. I, I imagine that I could be wrong, but I imagine every one of these shows goes about what are we at like 45 minutes here, and then yeah. you guys before actually you guys stop the broadcast and then probably geek out on this stuff for another 45 minutes before you move on. That's just right. my guess. <laughs> um, it, it, so usually is there's, there's a few more minutes of of a uh, of fun geek talk afterwards, but uh, sometimes we both have things to get to, so we do have to hop up, but um, yeah, it's it's been a fun ride already, and it's, this is only episode four, and the podcast isn't even public yet, this is the best part, we're recording this, and um, we're still waiting for, where you know, we hired um, a professional to do intros and outros and the music, so I'm waiting for those to be finished before we can actually get the podcast out, so um, the cool part is, hopefully by the time the podcast is out and on iTunes, Stitcher, and all that stuff, um, there'll be five episodes, you know, this is episode four. Hopefully there'll be five episodes, knock on wood, before the po- podcast even goes live. So yeah. so we're um, basically talking into the future right now. We are we talking are. in the future. <laughs> yeah. This uh, is fun. See, I, 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 uh, I hope it doesn't date your podcast, but last night I heard, um, uh, I was driving, and that last night was the premiere, pre-premiere of the Star Wars, uh, whatever yeah. the Star Wars movie is, and I thought, boy, that would have been fun to get invited to that. How do you get an invite to that? <laughs> right. In its own little way, I feel like I got a little invite here to the pre-premiere, yeah. you know, something before it is even live. It's like the future is happening right now. Yeah. Right, because if you're if you're listening to this now, Star Wars is out. Um, <laughs> today, I, officially, officially is today. It today. All right. Yeah. I did see Scott recommended on Facebook a Chrome plugin so you can block all the spoilers, but you won't <laughs> need that when you're listening because you'll have already seen it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It was really funny. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's a good it's a good extension, and actually, it's it's so good that it actually blocks. Uh, if you go to a page that has the word "star" or "wars," it blocks it. Um, so I, I was wow. thinking about the mechanics of it. It's definitely going to block more than you want it to. But if yeah. you're a true Star Wars fan and you can't see it until later, you know it'll get the job done. Yeah. I got I got my ticket for Christmas Day. There's my there's my nerdy tree. Okay. And the best part is there's a button in Chrome. That is two lightsabers as an X. So, nice. um, you know, it's definitely a nerdy <laughs> Chrome extension. That's fantastic. I love it. Yeah. But um, okay. So, uh, <laughs> um, thank you, uh, thank you, Jared, for joining us today. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, Rachel, for being an awesome co-host as usual. Thank you, Scott. Um, Same yes. to you. <laughs> you can find the show notes uh, at imagely.com/podcast. Slash four, four, and, and yes, four, <laughs> and be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. Thank you again, and we'll talk soon. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to the WordPress Photography Podcast. To listen to other episodes and to subscribe to the podcast via iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and more, please visit imagely.com forward slash podcast.